So back in January, I got this weird idea to create my very own cinematic universe using abandoned superheroes straight out of the public domain. Characters with backstories and abilities so absurd and unpopular that they were thrown away almost immediately after they were originally published. And for better or worse, this concept has stuck with me, and evidently with many of you too. My inbox is full of fan art, storyline pitches, resumes, all of whom want a taste of bargain bin cinematic action. And while I half-jokingly suggested that I had begun writing scripts for some of these hypothetical movies, I found myself, like, oddly motivated after getting so much positive feedback. So, even though it started as a complete joke, over the past three months, I wrote an entire movie for the first superhero. <laughs> Why do I do this? Today I'm sharing with you the story of Atlas, the history of the superhero and what I think a modern adaptation might look like. So to begin, you should know that the Man of Might appeared in an obscure comic book called Daring Adventures, owned by the company IW Publications, aka Super Comics, one of the many short-lived companies capitalizing on the back end of the Golden Age. There's a bit of history. In the mid-1950s, the United States Senate formed a subcommittee to investigate the growing problem of juvenile delinquency in America, and the comic book business found itself caught in the crosshairs. Completely upended by this shift in public perception and fearing the possibility of government regulation, many comic book publishers simply chose to close up shop. They sold off their properties and inventory and began pursuing other genres and mediums. By the end of the 50s, starting a new comic book company seemed like one of the worst business decisions imaginable. Nobody was buying, and even if they did, the newly implemented censorship of the Comics Code Authority ensured that any stories being told were watered down and uninspired. But a businessman named Israel Waldman saw things differently. Sensing a hole in the market, he launched IW Publications, a super low-budget comic book company that would sell primarily in grocery stores, usually in packs three issues for a quarter. Waldman's strategy was simple, flood discount stores with tons of different comics from every genre imaginable, sell all of them for super cheap and within a few years become the biggest name in the business. And from 1958 to 1964, IW Publications had around 115 different titles, each with their own collections of stories and characters. How was he able to amass such an incredible volume of content in such a short amount of time? He stole it! While planning out his business, Walden discovered that all those comic book companies that had closed their doors over the previous years, they sold their printing plates to random companies at rock bottom prices just to get rid of excess equipment. Walden meticulously tracked these abandoned printing plates down, bought them from scrap markets and aftermarket options for super cheap, and just fired them back up and began printing those comics again under his own company's label. Sometimes he'd make sure to acquire the actual intellectual property rights for these stories, but a lot of times he totally didn't and just sold those stories anyway, occasionally just designing new cover art or giving the characters in the stories different names. Using this borderline, if not totally illegal strategy, Walden's team had a huge selection of titles to sell, but they did lots of other tricks too. They would purposely misnumber certain issues to make particular their catalogs seem more reputable. They would hire up-and-coming artists and illustrators who worked for cheap to create more original publications that they would then sandwich stolen titles between. Because he refused to spend a lot of money on upfront costs, most of these original comics were usually super low quality. The characters were often uninspired or straight-up propaganda, but over time the remaining comic readership in America started to see through these gimmicks and IW Comics became synonymous with poor quality ripoffs. And all that brings us back to Daring Adventures, one of IW's many attempts at the horror suspense genre. It began with issue number nine and ran for eight issues until the company's final days in 1964. The last installment was Daring Adventures 18 
On the cover is our man, Atlas. Two interesting things here. Number one, the origin story on the cover doesn't match the plot of the actual comic at all. And number two, Atlas is not a horror suspense story. It's an action adventure. All this lends credence to the possibility that the company knew that they were nearing the end and they just kind of threw together whatever leftover comics they had in the bin to make one last print run for their final issues. Atlas tells the story of Jim Randall, a wimpy and down on his luck office clerk who has eyes for a lady named Linda Thompson, who has just started working down the office hall as a stenographer. Jim shoots his shot and offers to walk Linda home one night, and to his surprise, she agrees. Outside Linda's place, the pair run into her younger brother, Andy, who is caught in a fight with another kid named Pug. Pug and his crew are working with Duke Cazzini, a local mobster. Linda steps up to defend her little brother, and Duke begins taunting her. Eventually, Jim finally decides to intervene and immediately finds himself punched in the face. Duke pieces out, and Linda pulls Jim and Andy inside. Utterly humiliated and nursing his wounds, Linda calls Jim out as a weak-kneed, sniveling mouse. Jim goes home, crawls into bed, and that night is visited in a dream by Atlas, the Greek god of strength. Having lost his patience with all the cowardly men on the face of the earth, Atlas teaches Jim a series of secret exercises to build his body and turn him into a magnificent man of might. Jim dons a superhero costume featuring Lenny leopard print underpants styled after circus strongmen and takes up the mantle of Atlas. With his newly developed super strength, Jim returns to defeat Duke, win back Linda, and thwart an elaborate gold heist. With the day saved, Jim serves as an example to Andy and the target readership of manly dedication to clean living, proper training, and use for right and justice. And in a stunning turn of events, nobody thought that this was an entertaining comic. So it turns out that the story of Atlas was inspired by a guy named Charles Atlas, one of the founding fathers of American bodybuilding and a pioneer of dynamic tension exercises, which are actually featured at the end of the comic. Although much of this is speculation, it is generally believed that in the 1940s, a publisher tried to convince real life Atlas to jump into the comic book business as a way to supplement a series of print advertisements that he had become popular for. A test run for Atlas Comics number one was commissioned, and it would even include an introductory message from Charles Atlas himself. For one reason or another, perhaps because the end result was lackluster, Atlas Comics never actually happened. The comic was never published, and the printing plates were quietly filed away. Well, guess who eventually got their hands on them? Whether they got permission or not isn't clear, but somehow the scrapped comic found its way into the IW catalog and eventually hit shelves headlining the final issue of Daring adventures. It's not not one of the most absurd stories. So regardless of the story's ridiculous origins, it has since fallen into the public domain. You can make your own adaptation of him, and that is what I have done. What sets my Atlas apart? I'm glad I asked. Meet Jim Randall, a timid and aimless IT guy at Comet Corporation. With the company set to be downsized due to poor performance, corporate sends an assessor by the name of Linda Thompson to rein in Jim's local branch and bring much needed company reform. Stuck without a ride home one evening, Linda's left in the parking lot and Jim shoots his shot, offering to drive her to her apartment on the seedy side of town. There, the two run into Andy getting pulverized by Pug, and Jim finds himself clocked by Butch, a henchman for the mysterious mob boss, Duke Cazzini. After Linda is forced to take matters into her own hands, she dresses Jim down and tells him to hit the road. That night, while in bed licking his wounds, Jim gets visited by Atlas and views a ghostly gallery of his life so far, a tale of timidity and cowardice. Jim has done done nothing meaningful in his life, and worse, he's too fearful to step up and be a hero when called upon to help those in need. 
After seeing how pathetic and aimless he's been for the first quarter of his life, Jim gets angry. He knows he's meant to do more with his life than just work at a job he hates, go home, eat potato chips, watch TV, and then die. Atlas convinces him to become the kind of man the world needs. A real man. Someone brave. Someone courageous. A hero. He agrees to train Jim, but only if he's willing to go all the way. Jim wakes up the next morning, redeems three months of unpaid time off, and travels to his uncle's ranch in Arizona, the Crossbar. There he spends an entire summer following Atlas's divine training regimen until he gets straight up jacked. With a new lease on life, Jim travels back home and starts getting his world in order. He joins a fitness club, gets promoted, renovates his house, and even shoots another shot with Linda, but things have gone quite downhill while he's been away. Linda lets slip that Andy is taken up with the Duke's gang, and she fears her little brother is getting in way too deep. Jim visits the bar that the Duke uses as a hideout one night, and after donning the signature costume, breaks in and tries to get Andy to see the light. Andy refuses to go home, thinking he's got a big payday coming by carrying out a special job for the Duke, and he bounces, leaving Jim to fight the entire gang all by himself, but hey, no problem for the new Atlas. Jim eventually pieces together the mystery of the Duke's great gold heist, stops a train from exploding, and chases the mob boss down during an Act 3 getaway plane sequence. But don't worry, I won't spoil the ending for you. Because while I said that I spent the last three months writing a script, I also might have spent that time prepping an animated adaptation. I can't let this idea go. So the entire movie has been storyboarded, research and development for characters, and major set pieces is pretty much done. And you know something? I think I'm gonna make this thing. If you all want it, I'm leaving it up to you. It's true, I have designed fully rigged character models for the entire lineup of the Bargain Bin cinematic universe, but it won't mean anything if we trip right out of the gate. To that end, I have opened a Kickstarter. Link in the description. Think of this like pre-selling a flick. You can reserve yourself a ticket for a truly one-of-a-kind story. Pitch in a little more, you can get your name in the credits. If there truly is enough interest, I will release some merch. This is not a Hollywood production. Do not expect Pixar quality animation. That is not what this is about. These bargain bin superheroes were made super fast with a lot of rough edges, and I want to capture that same spirit with this. You know those terrible, like, straight-to-video animated Barbie movies? That's sort of the vibe I'm going for. It's an acquired taste, so the goal has been set accordingly. If I can't raise the money, I'll just, I don't know, put the script online under some kind of sharing license. I don't know why, but I truly believe Atlas's ridiculous story has the potential to be a so bad that it's good superhero movie. I could be completely wrong. Let's find out. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. They can help you put together a beautiful website in no time. Start by selecting from one of their many stunning templates and then customize it to your specific needs. If you're an aspiring podcaster, their audio and video blocks will be right up your alley. Their all new member areas feature makes it easy to build an online community. If you wanna sell something, they make it easy to set up an online storefront. You can get started today by visiting squarespace.com to start a free trial. When you're ready to launch your site, head over to squarespace.com slash Austin McConnell to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain.